Hi there! I'm Jen, this is Remembered Reads, and this is going to be a wrap-up of my past couple of weeks in reading. I think my favorite thing that I read this week was Susie Hansen's Notes on a Foreign Country, An American Abroad in a Post-American World. At a glance, this looks almost like travel journalism, but what it actually turns out to be is the author unpacking the myth of American exceptionalism, and what a belief in that myth results in both on a personal level and a societal level in terms of understanding the impact of American politics abroad. And not just politics internally, but in terms of US government pressure and also really overt military action and covert military action in other countries. The author is an American who grew up in the Northeast and had what she thinks of as kind of an intellectual circle of friends and people who knew things about the world. But what she finds out when she moves to Istanbul is that she doesn't really have an understanding of the rest of the world in relation to her own country's history and to those countries' history. So the format that this book takes is she will have a chapter looking at her life in Turkey, and then she has various chapters where she visits other countries and relates American political history to that relationship within those countries. So she deals with Turkey, Greece, Egypt, Iran, and Afghanistan. The chapter about Afghanistan I thought didn't fit with the rest of the book because it's so clearly about overt military invasion and occupation, whereas in the other countries it's much more subtle and it's about infrastructure and sometimes political coups, but not that same overt Piece. I, I don't think the I think the average American is aware of US involvement in, in Afghanistan even if they're not aware of the history and of who's being supported during the Cold War for example whereas I think the things about Greece and Turkey and Egypt and to a certain extent Iran although well see I was almost gonna allow that maybe more people knew about that but I think maybe they don't um, and that was very interesting. So she breaks down her perceptions of all of that over a 10 year period, which I found fascinating because I know, you know, I just left the US after having lived there for four years. And there was, I always had a sense, and I've talked about this in other videos before, where there's a perception of history that seemed to be missing something. And this book really explains why that's missing and where that comes from. And so I thought this was a fascinating read, even as I said, I didn't think the structure 100% worked, but I thought it was really fascinating. I also thought it was interesting um, comparing it to um, Melina Tumani's There Was and There Was Not, which I read earlier this year, which is also about Amer an American who goes and lives in Istanbul in that case, because she's trying to work out uh, some of the complexities of Armenian-Turkish relations. But both of these authors, ended up befriending Kurdish men who challenged their perceptions. And I thought, is that some strange trope that we're seeing in these semi-memoir, semi-historical writing? I don't know. But in any case, I really enjoyed this, but I don't know that I would have enjoyed it as much if I weren't just sort of deconstructing my own experience of having just lived in the United States and leaving. So. I don't know, but I did quite enjoy it, and it's not the travel writing that I thought it was. Next up, I read a graphic memoir, and that is Tomboy by Liz Prince. I had seen Sue from Sue's Book Nook talk about this during the Get Graphic readathon. It is basically a recounting of the author's childhood and her development into her identity as a woman who just likes to wear men's clothes and how that doesn't have to have broader social meaning, more or less. I didn't find it to be particularly deep. It was entertaining while I was reading it, but now that a couple of weeks have passed, there isn't a lot about this that stood out to me, which surprised me because I thought I would like this more because I, I was quite a tomboy as a kid, so I thought I would identify it with, with it more, and I didn't. And I didn't feel like there was enough commentary for it to grab me on any other level. So it was fine and entertaining enough, but that's about all I have to say about that one. Just in case you're curious about the art style, there is a sample page of that. And I followed that up by reading another graphic memoir, and that was L'Algerie c'est beau comme l'Amérique, 
by Olivier Breton and, and drawn by Marie Grand. This tells the story of the author's relationship with her mother and her grandparents, who were pieds noirs or colonials in Algeria, but multi-generational colonials. And then it goes on to recount her experience going back to Algeria and trying to identify the places in her mother's stories and in her grandparents' stories and seeing the places they lived, both in Algiers and also in the countryside. And it also goes through, it touches on a lot of the political issues, but it leaves them in the background, which, looking at some of the reviews I've seen of this, I think some people were a little unsatisfied with that because it doesn't deal head first with kind of colonial attitudes and with attitudes that arose around both settlement and then around the War of Independence. I think there's some implicit commentary in almost the pauses that are drawn into it, but because none of that's explicit, I think this makes a few people, made some people uncomfortable based on what I've read. But I thought it was quite compelling and looked at an interesting family situation. It had, the art style is black and white, it's very traditional. Um, I think this is one that if you read this in the English translation, which does exist and I believe is called Algeria is Beautiful Like America, you would definitely know that this was a French style comic because it definitely has that style to it. After that, I read Justin Seaman's Dear White People, A Guide to Interracial Harmony in Post-Racial America, which I believe was written after the movie but before the TV series. It's basically funny social commentary about American race relations, although basically strictly black and white race relations. Um, the author addresses that on, I think, the first or second page. It's entertaining enough, but I, because it was dealing with some similar social distinctions to some of the books I had been reading immediately previously, which took it a lot more seriously, this came off as being quite flippant, which I don't think is fair because I don't think this is meant to be taken seriously. So I think I would have enjoyed this a lot more if I had read it in between less serious material. So there you go. But if you were a fan of the movie or the TV series, it might be entertaining to read. But otherwise, I thought it was amusing, but the slight. Next up, I read a fantasy novel, and that is The Blood Print by Ausma Zehanat Khan, who, of course, is known for writing mysteries. She writes the Getty Katak mysteries, which I always enjoy because they're set in Toronto and deal with uh, a lot of topics that I'm interested in as the, the plugs that they put into their mystery framework. Uh, this is a very formulaic epic fantasy in that we have a hero, the hero's sidekick, the hero's love interest, and a quest that they need to go on. And this being the first book in a series, it, it does end on a cliffhanger. What was interesting about this is that the bits that are plugged into it are very different from the standard, and in multiple ways, which I appreciated. I think there are a lot of fantasy novels that are sold on having one or two differences to the standard, and this has quite a few differences, although it does follow the formula to the letter. So if you are bored with formulaic fantasy, regardless of what's plugged into it, you probably aren't going to enjoy this, but if you enjoy that and just want to see someone mix it up, this is a great example of this. I've complained before about uh, fantasy novels that give you a map and it's clearly either the British Isles or Japan, with the names changed a little bit. This one also does a map that's clearly a real place, but I have never seen an epic fantasy novel written in English that is set in Central Asia, and this one is. So points for something a little different, even though I am kind of tired of the map of Earth. A lot of the equivalents are pretty obvious. Uh, Kandahar is called Kandor. Samarkand is Marakand. Um, I was thinking Ashfall was Ashgabat, but it's actually a little further south, so maybe it's not supposed to be Ashgabat. But in any case, there's a lot of that. Plot-wise, what I thought was entertaining about this is that it has basically a pseudo-medieval setting, but it plays with what basically seems to be inspired by the Taliban fighting the Soviets in the 80s. Because in this, we have a kind of renamed Taliban organization called the Talisman, and there is a group of people from what's called the Transcap, but which is basically Russia and possibly Kazakhstan. And these two organizations are fighting each other in various places in this world. The main character is a woman who is a wizard of sorts, 
uh, and has the power of the claim, which is their religious text that they recite and magic happens because of that. The claim is basically an English translation of the Quran with with the word God replaced by the word the one, which at first I found distracting, but eventually I went with it and it was okay. It works more or less. What's interesting is as it progresses, it's clear the characters don't quite understand how their magic works. So I'm definitely curious to see how that works as this series goes on. The main character is from the pseudo Pashto ethnic group. Her sidekick is a pseudo East African. There are maybe some unfortunate stereotypes that fall into that because they have very much the relationship that you see in a lot of pseudo British fantasy where there's a blonde hero who has a Moorish sidekick and it's exactly those tropes. So if, you know, if you're bored of that or if you find that offensive, I don't know that it's any better because the specific ethnicities are changed, but that's there. The one thing that I found a little distracting is that every male that this character, that the main character encounters is basically in love with her and it's made a big deal that her love interest is the most beautiful man around and everyone comments on it. And I found that a little bit tedious. I thought they could have just been good looking and not the most beautiful ever because it gets a little ridiculous. But still, the one other caveat that I would say is that it's very slow going at the beginning. I didn't feel particularly engaged with it until about chapter 16, but once you get there, there are some really spectacular action scenes. And there's one scene set in a valley that builds a sort of stealth or suspense piece that then goes into a battle scene that I thought was handled brilliantly. So I really enjoyed those elements, but yeah, it, it was chapter 16 before it really got going with any of that. Still entertaining enough. And finally, I am listening to Love in the Time of Cholera by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. This was translated by Edith Grossman and I was listening to the audiobook, which is read by Armando Duran. And this is very pretty. I am technically not finished with this. I have about an hour left in it, but close enough that I feel comfortable talking about it. It is one of those portraits of a man who is hopelessly in love with a woman for years and years, and let's talk about his pining. Within that framework, this is very prettily written. The prose is beautiful. All of the descriptions are just lovely, of places and of people and of birds and of deaths even. So I really enjoy that element to it, because, especially because it's something that I'm reading as I'm walking the dog and it's nice to have that kind of flowery language. I enjoy it in that context. In terms of plot, the basic opening is that there is an elderly couple and the woman ends up widowed and her the lover from her youth shows up. And drama does not ensue, mostly flashbacks ensue. <laughs> In between we find out basically, basically that lovesickness is as likely to kill people as cholera, except it might kill your loved ones instead of yourself. I don't know. <laughs> I wouldn't necessarily say that's the moral of the story, but it was very here is a man pining, which is not necessarily a story that I don't want to hear. I have enjoyed, like earlier this year, I really enjoyed uh, Museum of Innocence, which is also about a man pining about it over an unavailable woman for years and years. Um, in this case, I felt like there wasn't enough else to it other than the very pretty writing and the let's talk about love sickness as a disease bit. So I think if I were reading this, I don't know that I would have stuck with it as I am because I'm listening to it. And because there's not much else to it, it is not super engaging. So there isn't a huge drive to keep going with it. It was funny, uh, the other day I had the headphones on and uh, I ended up talking to someone as I was walking the dog. And I didn't notice that I hadn't hit pause even when I put the headphones back in. I thought, I think I probably missed about 15 minutes, but, um, and I did back up, but I didn't need to, at least in terms of plot, because nothing had happened. It was just all more descriptive language, which is pretty. And if you're in it for the poetry, that's great. But if you're actually looking for plot, this is probably not something you want to pick up. But, um, I have been enjoying it in this format and I do like the job that the narrator was doing. All right, so I do have a couple of other things I'm going right now, but I don't think I'm far enough into them to chat about them yet. In any case, I hope you've had a good week. That's it for now. Ciao.